All right, hi everyone and welcome to the February MAP webinar. This is Dan Barry and I'm joined in the room here by Ken Mooney, Don Anderson, Anarita Mariotti, Wayne Higgins, and Jim Todd. And uh, the topic of today's webinar is evaluating recently developed reanalysis projects. We have uh, four speakers talking about three projects. Uh, first speaker is Gil Campo from NOAA Ezreal. Uh, and he'll speak on evaluating the 20th century reanalysis data set from 1871 to 2010. Second speaker is Edmund Chang from SUNY Stony Brook. Uh, uh, Stony Brook University, I think they like to call it, but I'm from New York, so I, I have to throw SUNY in front there. Um, and the title of that talk is Using 20th Century Reanalysis Data to Examine Northern Hemisphere Storm Track Trends in the 20th Century. And then finally, uh, Bob Kistler and Arun Kumar are going to split the final talk. They're both from the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Um, Arun is from the Climate Prediction Center and Bob is from the Environmental Modeling Center. And the title of their talk is that Climate Reforecast System Reanalysis and Subsequent Reanalysis Efforts. So, Gil, are you on the line? I am. Okay, great. Um, so what I'm going to do now is pass control over to your computer. Hopefully we get the Mac. Gil's on his Mac and his PC right now, just to have a backup. <laughs> Sharing my desktop. Looks good. Great. Okay, so I'd like to remind everybody on the line just to mute your phones. And uh, Gil, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Great. Well, thanks, Dan, for inviting me, and thanks for everyone who's uh, physically present with Dan and who's on the line for uh, listening in on this webinar. So this is work that uh, Jeff Whitaker, Prashant Sardeshmuk, and I are doing here at uh, the University of Colorado and NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory. And uh, if there's time, we'll also talk about some of the extensions that we're doing with uh, Ben Geis at Texas A&M University. And I need to say a special thank you to uh, NSEP Environmental Modeling Center for their use of the model and also the National Climactic Data Center for uh, all their work with the observations as well as the UK Mid Office Hadley Center and all of our partners through the Atmospheric Circulation Reconstructions Over the Earth Initiative. And uh, as well to all of my co-authors on the uh, 20th Century Reanalysis Project. So just to give you an overview of the project, uh, it's an international collaboration that we're leading here in NOAA series. Uh, the idea is to produce high quality tropospheric reanalyses for the last 130 years. We're now back 140 years. Uh, using only surface pressure observations. And this is not a minus in this case. Surface pressure in particular is more than a surface variable. It tells you something about the entire atmospheric column. And its time tendency tells you about the divergence of mass from that column. As soon as you have two surface pressure observations, you know something about the wind through geostrophy. And you know something about the vertical distribution of the wind through the thermal wind. If you have some guess as to the distribution of temperature, you can then advect that temperature and continue to derive even more information. And those are the sort of physics that we're using to, uh, to do this reconstruction. So what we're producing here are the first ever estimates of the near surface and tropospheric six hourly fields extending back to the end of the 19th century. And I'll show you results that go back to 1871. Um, because we're going to be using an ensemble system to do this reanalysis, you get estimates of uncertainties in the basic reanalysis fields at every grid point for every time for every variable. And you can also estimate uncertainties in derived quantities such as storm tracks. Simply because of data availability, the product has higher quality in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. And of course, we need to thank our sponsors, the U.S. Department of Energy Insight Program and its Office of Science, who provided uh, computing awards, and also the NOAA Climate Program Office, um, which supported us to produce 1871 to 2008, and also extend as far as 2010. And uh, you can read more about the results I'm showing in the paper we published in the Quarterly Journal, and there's the digital object identifier number. So I want to briefly talk about the ensemble filter algorithm that we use to produce the data set. The idea is to produce an analysis uh, that is the vector XA, and it's a weighted combination of a first guess XB and the observation YO. Here our observations are only surface pressure. And that weight matrix K, the gain, is going to vary in our system with the atmospheric flow and with the observation network so that when observations are very sparse, 
will give more weight to the observations. And if you're in a flow that's uh, rapidly developing low, for instance, will also give relatively more weight to the observations. We use a 56 member ensemble, and uh, we do need monthly boundary conditions. Those come from HAD ISST for the sea surface temperature and the sea ice distribution. And of course, to generate our first guess XB, uh, that ensemble of uh, 56 first guesses, we use an NSEP model, the NSEP uh, global forecast system. This was a 2008 version that was experimental. And its primary features that we needed were the time varying carbon dioxide concentration. It could also include uh, solar and volcanic radiative forcing. So to give you um, one example of the evaluation that we've been doing, here I'm showing the local anomaly correlation between the sub-daily 20th century reanalysis and era 40 on the left panel, and also between the 20th century reanalysis and radiosonde data uh, in the right panel. And this is all at 300 hectopascal geopotential height for the period 1958 to 78. Of course, era 40 being another reanalysis that uses, uh, it uses upper air data is continuous over this period, whereas the radiosondes are discontinuous. What you can see in the northern hemisphere is that the correlations between these two data sets are, are quite high. They're not as high as comparing ERA-40 with the ncep ncar reanalysis. That's indicated by the black curve here, the thick black curve. Shows where ncep ncar reanalysis and ERA-40 correlate higher than 0 0.975. Uh, the highest correlations the 20CR has with ERA-40 get up into 0 0.95, say, over the uh, Atlantic storm track and Pacific storm track regions. And these correlations are quite similar if we go and look at the radiosonde data for geopotential height across the northern hemisphere. Now if we look in the tropics, it's kind of surprising. The correlations with the radiosondes are significantly lower than the correlations with the reanalysis, suggesting that maybe the combination of temperature and wind data in the reanalysis is creating a a better field for geopotential height than just using the temperature and integrating that up, which is how the radiosonde geopotential height would be derived. It may also indicate other problems in the tropics. In the southern hemisphere, the situation is reversed. The correlations with ERA-40 are much lower than they are with the in situ radiosonde data. And this is probably because ERA-40 used a fixed uncertainty in assimilating those radiosonde data. And that uncertainty was appropriate for having satellite data starting in 1979. So probably the ERA-40 field is a little too much first guess and not enough actual uh, assimilation field uh, before about 1979. That, uh, that idea is furthered if we compare with ERA-40 after 1979. You can see that both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere correlations with the 20th century reanalysis are very comparable. And in the region of the black here where ERA-40 and ncep reanalysis correlate very, very highly, uh, we see really good agreement. Because we have an ensemble system, we have an estimate of uncertainty. Uh, and here we'd like to do a comparison to see how reliable is that uncertainty. So the time series that I'm showing you for the northern hemisphere on the left, the southern hemisphere on the bottom, show the actual root mean square difference between the first guess and the pressure observations as a function of time. And the red curve is the expected RMS difference. You can see that from 1871 to 2008, they co-vary pretty well. And overall, the uncertainty decreases as the number of observations given in black increases. And note the log scale here. This is true both in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. There are a couple of periods of general uh, disagreement. For instance, in the early part of the record, we think this may be a problem with our uncertainty parameterization. And in the middle part of the record, we actually think this might be a problem with the ship observations themselves. Professor Chang on the line and others have shown that the air in the ships in the uh, mid part of the second half of the 20th century might be larger than what we assumed it to be. But overall, the uncertainty estimates are consistent with the actual differences between the first guess and the pressure observations, even as the network is changing over the 140 years. 
another way to evaluate uh, reanalysis quality is to look at the quality of forecasts. And in, in this case, we're looking at 24-hour forecasts, and we're verifying against the marine observations only of pressure. Uh, and these are showing for forecasts from the NCEP NCAR reanalysis in the orange, from 20CR in the blue, and from ERA 40 in the red. And we're referencing here a persistence forecast, and that's going to vary because we're only looking at the marine observations and they're moving around. And uh, so here you can see our axis is uh, root mean square error. So for the northern hemisphere, all three systems are better than persistence back to the beginning of the record in uh, 1948 here. And the upper air base data sets are significantly better than 20CR throughout the period, which is what you would expect. They're using the radio sonds in the early part of the record, and they have the advantage of the satellites, and you can see how their quality improves over time. In the southern hemisphere, it's a bit of a different story because both the Enzabenka reanalysis and ERA-40 had their weighting geared towards the satellite period. Then in the southern hemisphere, where the data are very sparse, actually just using the surface pressure observations is giving you a superior 24-hour forecast. And that holds true until you start to get the satellite data in the mid to late 1970s. And then, as expected, the two upper air base systems become superior. We're also interested in this data set not just for its synoptic variability or weather, but also for climate. And one way to look at that is to look at the pattern correlation between monthly anomalies. Here I'm showing those correlations for geopotential height between 20CR and ERA-40 and 20CR and NCEP NCO reanalysis for the 300 hectopascal geopotential height as a function of time for the month of December in blue and for the month of June in the red and orange. And the two different curves are the comparisons with the two different reanalyses. And the other months fall in between these two extremes, whereas December correlations are the highest and June correlations are the lowest. You can see, looking at the variations of these correlations with time, that there's a, a general increase in, in about 1979, where the correlations have become higher as the upper air base data sets improve with the satellite data. But in general, these correlations are, are fairly high, and they're also significantly higher than what you would expect if the only information about the monthly mean 300 hectopascal geopotential height was coming simply from the sea surface temperature forcing. The correlations would be more like the black curves instead of the curves that you're seeing here. We'd also like to look at another uh, climate aspect, and here's, here's one, the uh, annual average land only 50 north to 50 south temperature anomalies at, uh, at two meters. And here I'm showing those from 1979 to 2008. There are lots of curves on here uh, for various different data sets. Mer the Mara reanalysis is in black. The, um, the University of East Anglia Crew Tem 3 is the yellow, including its 95% uncertainty. The NASA GIS temp is in green. The ERA interim data set estimate of this is in red. The University of Delaware estimate is in purple, and the blue hatching is the 20th century reanalysis. For this period, from 1979 to 2008, you can see that overall the data sets agree very well. The lowest correlation with 20th century reanalysis is 0 0.88 with the University of Delaware, and several are at 0 0.91. And the, the lowest RMS error happens to be with the GIST temp data set, and that's why it has the little plus signs on it, whereas the highest RMS error uh, difference with 20th century reanalysis happens to be the University of Delaware data set, and that's called out with the boxes. But the other thing to notice is that the 95% error ranges between crew tem and the 20th century reanalysis are, are fairly consistent throughout the period. It's also interesting to note here in the gray, we've indicated the 95% range of the CMIP-3 ensemble, uh, that most of the time the, all the estimates stay within that range with a few exceptions, such as the uh, El Nino of 97-98 uh, year, for instance. Uh, one more climate-based um, set of series I'd like to show you. These are seasonal climate indices for three different uh, well-known variables. One is the Pacific Walker circulation on top. 
One's the North Atlantic Oscillation in the middle, and the bottom is the Pacific North America Pattern Index. And here we're going back to 1870 and up to the year 2008. There are several different estimates on here. The pink is the 20th century reanalysis, and I'd like to call out the light blue, which is from a statistical reconstruction. You can see that the 20th century reanalysis agrees well with the other estimates. Here are some of the other reanalyses when we get to the second half of the 20th century. Uh, it also, for the Pacific Walker circulation, agrees very well with an, a sea surface temperature force series. Uh, this model so-called includes SST forcing as well as some uh, chemistry. For the North Atlantic Oscillation, the, uh, it's no surprise that a pressure-based uh, data set agrees well with a pressure-based reconstruction in the light blue. Um, and it's also no surprise that there's very little relationship with the SST forcing indicated by the, uh, the gray shading here and this thick gray curve. But all the data sets ex agree extraordinarily well in the sign magnitude and variability of the NAO. And they agree fairly well for the Pacific North America pattern index. And in fact, it was a surprise to me just how well a statistical reconstruction agrees with the 20th century reanalysis. The statistical reconstruction, I should point out, is independent of the sea surface temperatures, although it does use uh, pressure data. And where available, it's also using upper air data, which starts with uh, kites in about 1905 here. The final thing I'd like to show you is one indicator of storm tracks. I know that. Um, uh, Professor Chang is going to talk about that more in just a minute. This particular measure is skewness, the third moment of uh, the 250 hectopascal daily vorticity. Here I'm showing this over the period 1989-90 uh, to 2005-06, and this is December through February. On the far left is uh, ERA interim's estimate of this quantity in the middle of the 20th century reanalysis. And on the far right is the Ntsepenkar reanalysis estimate of this quantity. And you can see that the 20th century reanalysis, despite having only surface pressure, has a, has a similar structure to both of the other estimates. And its magnitude is actually higher than what we see in, uh, in the Ntsepenkar reanalysis, but still below what we see in ERA interim. And perhaps surprisingly, if we now look at this in the 20CR, throughout uh, a much longer period. Here I've reproduced the skewness plot that I showed you previously. And now I'm showing it to you for uh, December through February 1891 to 2005, six. And you can see that the structures throughout the waveguide are very similar. You can see the nice split jet, for instance, and its effect on skewness that we might expect. Uh, so it was kind of a surprise to us just how remarkably robust these storm track features are. So I'd like to um, go ahead and, uh, and give you a summary. So I hope I've demonstrated that, uh, that the surface-based reanalyses throughout the troposphere are, are feasible once you've used uh, an advanced data simulation system like the Ensemble Common Filter. 4D VAR will probably give you a very similar result. So what this allows us to do is effectively double the reanalysis record length from about 60 years to more than 140 years. And that'll give us the potential for putting current atmospheric circulation patterns in a broader historical context. Uh, I've given you some uh, hint of evidence that the southern hemisphere fields may actually be an improvement over the first generation of the upper air-based reanalyses before the satellite era. There are going to be some challenges with further evaluations of this data set, especially when we try to validate it in regions that have sparse observations themselves and that are rapidly changing, such as the Arctic. Oh, it's ringing. Is it going to just redial? Um, the request cannot be performed. Okay. It's dialed. The, the last Verify thing is the about the large-scale variability. It does appear to be um, consistent with the other reanalysis. Dan, how much time do I have? Um, that's about it. Perfect. That's been about 15 minutes, so that was perfect delivery. Okay. Verify the procedure. So there's somebody on the phone who seems to be dialing into another phone number right now. Can you please move your mute your phone so that we don't hear your dialing? Thank you. Okay, Gil. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Dan, um, can I just say, I, this is Yolanda. I can't actually. I can hear on the phone, but I can't load the WebEx. Is anyone else having that trouble? I'm not able to see any of the slides. Has anyone else had trouble with WebEx? 
it's operated fine for I think all of our speakers in here in in the office. So okay. I would say just try it again with a different browser, or if you have access to another computer, maybe try it on another computer. Yeah, I changed the computer and it was fine. Okay, all right. So if you have a question for Gil, please hold it until the end. We're going to go through all three of the talks in order and then have a general discussion. So write it down so you remember. Um, so our next speaker is Edmund Chang. Edmund, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Okay, Edmund, so I'm going to switch control over to your computer. Can you see Great. my computer? Yeah, we can. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and give your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me uh, discuss this topic here. Uh, my topic is a follow-up to uh, Gil's presentation. So he actually made a very nice introduction to my uh, talk. Uh, the, topic, the title of my talk today is Using 20th Century Analysis Data to Examine Northern Hemisphere Storm Track Trend in the 20th century. And this is research funded by uh, a NOAA project uh, assessing the quality of the scale variability derived from the 20th century reanalysis project. So Gail actually discussed some of the main points about the uh, 20th century reanalysis already, so I don't really need to uh, talk about it. Uh, the motivation is that uh, for over the last 10 years, uh, a number of studies actually have suggested that the Northern Hemisphere storm track activity has increased between 1950 and 1999. Uh, those analyses were mainly based on NSEP and CAR reanalysis data. However, uh, a few recent studies actually suggested that NSEP, NCAR, and ERA 40 reanalysis may contain spurious trends or jumps uh, due to change in the observing system because they assimilate all data especially the introduction of satellite data in the 1970s, and also the uh, increasing amount of uh, aircraft observations in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, both could lead to spurious trends uh, in, uh, in a number of variables. And as descri uh, described by, that, uh, by Gill, the 20th century analysis used only surface observations, and so it's expected to contain less on a spirit trend, especially uh, since the 1950s when the surface observing system uh, is actually not, uh, doesn't really change quite a lot. So the question is, is that true? And another related question is that, can we use the 20th century analysis to assess trend not just between 1950 to 99, but also for the entire 20th century. So uh, in this study, I used a slightly different uh, parameters to, to uh, represent storm track activity uh, than the one that Gil showed at the end of his uh, present presentation. Uh, what I use is a variance computer using a 24-hour difference filter. It's a very simple variance. Uh, and the beauty of it is that it's very easy to compute from observations, even with obs observation gaps. So uh, it's just, uh, we use meridional velocity, uh, so it's just V at uh, keep us 24 hours minus V squared and average over a month. Uh, that's basically what we use as indicator of storm track activity, any grid point. And the uh, the, the, the filter actually has a, a response function that has a half power point as 1.2 and 6 days. So it's sort of similar to a previously used bandpass filter, uh, but it's much, much simpler to apply. And uh, this is actually a, a, a map that shows the uh, storm track as indicated by this uh, quantity. Uh, the contour shows the mean taken from the NSEP and CAR reanalysis, uh, DJF 1849 to 9899, so it's 51 year mean. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, we can see the Pacific and Atlantic storm track uh, peak uh, clearly. Uh, the, the boxes or shaded boxes uh, on this map actually shows the number of 
uh, the, the, the stations that has number of years of observation uh, that are significant. Uh, here I mean uh, over 90 uh, observations uh, within the three months. So uh, you can see that there are a lot of observations over the U.S. as well as uh, Europe, but over other parts, even over the continent, uh, there are much fewer observations. And then over the ocean, there are uh, very, very few stations with more than 30 years of data. Now, so that's the problem is that the storm track is over the region where there are sparse observations. Uh, so, uh, Hanik and Chen actually compared uh, NSEP and car reanalysis with radio storm observation. So, so what we did uh, in our 2003 paper was to take all the uh, radio storm observations uh, that we can get uh, from the NSEP and car reanalysis data set, and those are the stations that have sufficient uh, uh, data, and split them into nine different regions and then compare the trend that we actually get, or the time series that we get, based on the variance computed using the radio sound observation, which is shown in uh, dark, dark solid line uh, in, the, uh, in this figure. Compare that to the NSAP and carry analysis uh, sampled at just the time and location where there's radio sound observation. And you can see that the trend uh, we get from the radio sound observation is significantly less than that we got from the NSAP NCAR reanalysis, even though NSAP NCAR actually uses the radio sound observation uh, as part of the input. So uh, the methodology for this study uh, is basically repeat that methodology, but actually use free uh, reanalysis data sets. Uh, we look at NSEP NCAR, ERA 40, and the 20th century analysis data set. Uh, since ERA 40 only starts 97, uh, 57, 58, so we start uh, uh, our period is uh, limited to that. Uh, we use six hour data from DJF 1957 to 58 uh, to 98, 99, 42 winters of data, and all data is interpreted, uh, interpolated onto the same 2.5 by 2.5 lat long grid. Uh, observations, we use Ravenstone observation at 300 hectopascal. Uh, the observations are also greeted onto the same 2.5 by 2.5 degree grid. The observed V is quality controlled by trimming at each grid point using climatology plus or minus for standard deviation. So this is sort of similar to coet trimming, but the result is actually not sensitive to the amount of trimming that we use. So I, I just want to show you one, uh, the calculation from one area uh, that's representative. So we take this region, which is we call W1 in Hanik and Chang, uh, which is Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Uh, and basically, uh, we take the radio sound observations and calculate the uh, variance for each month and then uh, compile the uh, DJF average for each year, and this is the time series we get from the observations uh, on the left. Now we do the same thing for the three other reanalysis, uh, 20th century in orange, uh, EC in uh, green, and NSAP A. And what we, and here we, again, this is uh, reanalysis filtered by observation sampled only at the observation location and time. And we can see a very high correlation uh, in the free, uh, between the free reanalysis and the observation time series. Now, note that actually the EC and NSAP actually assimilate those observations, but the 20th century reanalysis only assimilates surface pressure and not the uh, radio zone observations. So, so here, the time series, the correlation is high, but we actually also compute the trend uh, based on these four time series, and they are shown on the left hand side. The cross is the observation, uh, the, is the observation based, based trend, uh, its percentage change over 40 years, and we can see that over this region, uh, that the, the Raven Sun observation actually shows that the variance increased by nearly 40% over the 20 year period. Uh, the 20th century analysis also shows a similar trend, and uh, the EC and NC is, NSAP is a little bit higher, and you can see a consistent pattern 
that the trend computed from the EC is higher than the 20th century reanalysis, and the trend uh, computed based on the NSAID reanalysis is still higher. So uh, the cyan represents the reanalysis actually sampled at all grid boxes and times within the box region, just to uh, see how much uh, a sampling error there is. And we can see that there's some difference, but uh, at least uh, the 95% error uh, estimate error limit actually overlapped. And they are and, and the, this trend between the 20th century EC and NSAP actually continues. Uh, within so the next figure uh, shows the nine digit, uh, areas. Uh, we don't actually need to go into detail for each one, but actually note that the consistency between the three different reanalysis for each of the nine areas. So in all nine areas, we see that the, the NSAP trend is the highest, whereas the trend computed from the 20th century reanalysis data is, is the lowest. And in four of these nine areas, uh, highlighted by this orange, uh, we s the 20th century analysis actually is estimate of the trend is closest to the observation, uh, whereas over four other areas, the of estimated trend is the closest to the observation. And again, EC, uh, the EC, uh, ERA 40 actually assimilate this observation. So uh, if we look at larger area or, uh, for example, all the land areas within the storm track region, what we find is that uh, the 20th century analysis now actually uh, uh, is more consistent with the observation. Uh, and then followed by the EC and NSAP is significantly higher. If we look at the entrance and exit of the Pacific storm track, what we find again is the uh, 20th century analysis is more consistent, and that also uh, is true for the entrance and exit region of the Atlantic storm track. And then if we actually look at the uh, full reanalysis, which actually contains huge regions without observations, or, or at least uh, without upper air uh, radio zone observations, what we find is that the trend is uh, consistent, and so we, we can infer from it that uh, we may probably use the 20th century and the other reanalysis to extrapolate over those regions. Uh, and if we do that uh, for the entire northern hemisphere and middle latitude, again, the 20th century reanalysis is most consistent with the observation. So uh, the summary of this comparison is that uh, even though rain and observation is actually submitted by NSAP and NCAR analysis and ERA 40, but not by 20th century analysis, uh, in four out of the nine regions, the trend based on 20th century reanalysis is actually most consistent with the rain and observations. In four regions, the trend based on ERA 40 are most consistent, but the trend based on NSAP and NCAR analysis are the consistently biased high. Uh, when average over the Pacific storm track entrance and exit and Atlantic storm track and exit and all northern hemisphere land areas, the trend based on the 20th century analysis is most consistent. And if we compare the trend based on the full reanalysis over the uh, storm track region, this is actually uh, just highlighting the Pacific, Atlantic, and northern hemisphere storm track, and the trend computed based on 20th century reanalysis, ERA 40, and NSAP NCAR reanalysis. And based on the comparison with observations, we, uh, we estimate that the 20th century analysis estimated trend is probably the closest to the actual trend. And in that case, the Pacific storm track increase is probably not significant. The Atlantic storm track change is significant, but the Northern Hemisphere one is barely significant at the 95% level. But actually, the Northern Hemisphere is increased mostly reflect, largely reflect the Atlantic increase. So the NSAP <coughs> uh, increase over the, the same period is actually appears to be extremely high and probably uh, extremely high, strongly biased. So this is sort of the a map of the change over uh, the decades. So we see <coughs> a 10 year period uh, between uh, in the 90s versus the 60s. And again, the 20th century analysis show a, a, a significant 
increase over uh, the Atlantic. So I'm going out. Of, uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, the net we just mentioned this. How about the entire 20th century uh, reanalysis record? Uh, for example, in the Atlantic, we actually see a jump uh, at 1970. So is that real? Uh, so one tool that we can use is the ensemble spread uh, that Bill mentioned. Uh, we uh, average the ensemble spread, the variance uh, over this free period we, uh, region. We can see that it's relatively constant uh, after 1950, especially for the Atlantic. And so we, we sort of can be assured that the quality of the 20th century analysis over the Atlantic is consistent after 1950. However, for the Pacific, it seems that it starts to be consistent since 57, 58. So the conclusion is that the quality of the reanalysis over the Atlantic probably consistent starting from 1950, whereas the quality of the Pacific analysis is consistent from about 57, 58. And then the jump in the Atlantic storm trap after 1970 appears to be real. So I probably should stop here, and I actually have some comments about then this uh, even further earlier, but uh, I'll leave it at the end uh, during the question period. Okay, thanks a lot, Edmund. That was a great presentation. Um, so, again, if you have questions for Edmund, uh, please hold them until the end. Um, Arun, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So, Arun, I'm going to go through the slides for you, and um, I just have to take control back. See the slides? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. So uh, just tell me next whenever you want me to switch the slides, and you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, well, Dave, uh, thanks, Dan, for inviting me and Bob for the presentation. Uh, this is a work has been done at NSTEP with support from Climate Program Office. So very thankful for that support while the work was going on and reached reach its conclusion. So what I'm going to do, and uh, we're going to split up this between myself and Bob Kessler. So in the next five, six slides, I will just show you a very brief introduction of climate forecast system reanalysis, which has been completed at NSEP. And then Bob will give you some, some introduction or ongoing work, which will follow up with the follow up on the climate forecast system reanalysis. So on the second slide, uh, it basic, describes the basic features of the climate forecast system reanalysis. Uh, it started in 1979. It's now updated in real time, so every day uh, you can come in and get the real time fields coming out of the reanalysis. And that's one of the uniqueness of this product is that it is running in, in a real time mode. The reanalysis itself was executed in six di different streams which overlap by year, and the reason for doing that was to just save on the clock time because if you run the whole thing in single stream, uh, it, it would have taken much longer than running the system in six parallel streams with a one-year overlap. Although it reduced the amount of execution time, and I did cause some other problems, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that later. Uh, it was a partially coupled reanalysis in the sense that the six-hour forecast came from a Six-hour guest field came from a couple model forecast, and the both atmosphere and the ocean and land were all uh, analyzed separately. So all the analysis, for example, for the atmosphere or the ocean are done separately, but the six-hour guest field comes from a uh, couple model forecast. So there's some, some level of consistency between the surface fluxes and evolution of SSTs. The atmospheric model was a T384 uh, resolution in horizontal, spectral resolution in horizontal, and 62 levels in vertical. So T384 is about 36 to 37 kilometer uh, resolution on a global scale, and the ocean model was a MOM4 from uh, GFDL. All the data is available. I have listed the uh, URLs there uh, from uh, NCDC and 
If you go to the spoke link, which they say cfsnsep.noaa.gov, ca slash cfsr, it provides you the provides you the further information. Uh, also about the information where you can get the real-time data. Uh, next slide, then. So we have looked at uh, or tried to quantify the features of the CFSR on two different uh, kind of analysis. One is on the weather time scale, and one is on the more on a low frequency or the climate time scale. So next couple of slides are on the weather time scale, and I can, I'll just show you the great features you can see in the CFSR. So in this, I don't have the mouse here, but I'll just try to uh, describe the figures. So top left panel is a rainfall, global rainfall analysis, which is run at uh, CPC called CMORF. It's run on a uh, three hourly cycle. So the top left panel is just one of the snapshots for a particular synoptic time. And you can see the frontal system in the extratropical latitudes and the rainfall, um, and for the rainfall. The top right is the, re and the same rain, for the same time is the rainfall from the reanalysis 2 system run at NSEB, and bottom left is the rainfall from the reanalysis 1, and bottom right is what you get from the CFSR, and immediately you can see the, the rainfall features are much well defined in the CFSR. Than they were than they were in the older reanalysis systems. So in general, the high resolution uh, reanalysis does capture a lot of and uh, rainfall is not in a simulated quantity; it's, it's being generated by by the analysis system or a simulation system. So high resolution does provide you a lot of features which are being observed uh, in the rainfall features which are being observed. Uh, next slide, then. Uh, here I'm just showing you a feature from the ocean side. So the previous one was uh, uh, related to the atmospheric variability. Uh, this one is the depiction of the tropical instability waves in the eastern Pacific. The left panel is the filtered sea surface temperature and shading and 10 meter winds in the contour uh, over the eastern tropical Pacific. The, the the x-axis is the longitude going from, I think, 100 dateline to the South America coast, and the y-axis is the time going from the March 2008 down to, sorry, it starts from the bottom starting in April 2008 going up to March 2007. The left, left panel is what you get from the reanalysis in terms of the uh, variability of Related tropical instability waves which move from the eastern Pacific to the western Pacific, and the right hand side is actually the observations. In this case, SST is from the trim microwave imager, TMI analysis, and the winds which are in contour are from the quick scat. And you can immediately see how well, or at least how well, the this analysis captures the high frequency variability in the oceanic fields, particularly in this case, uh, tropical and waves in the eastern Pacific. Uh, next slide, Dan. So those two were just the examples of the synoptic scale features in the atmosphere and the ocean, and they're very well captured if you compare them, compare these features with the independent analysis, for example, rainfall or uh, instability waves or eddies in the ocean. So now there are a couple of examples on the low frequency variability where you start to see some issues either related to the data ingest of the new data or related to uh, the stream boundaries. So next slide, please. please uh, here's an example of problems caused by uh, uh, changes in the observing system, particularly in the atmosphere. So what's shown here is a time series of imbalance in the model at P minus E in the dark line, and the dashed line is the increment in the precipitable water. Um, the x-axis goes from start of the reanalysis from 1979 to up to about 2000. And around 1999, beginning of the 99 uh, is the one when we started started to assimilate the AMSU data, and Bob can tell you more about, Bob will tell you something more about in his presentation. And just because of change in the simulation observing system, you can immediately see a jump in the in the some of the fields in the in the reanalysis. So in this particular example is the imbalance between precipitation and evaporation in the solid line and then the precipitable water and immediately you see a jump going from an average of 0.2 to 
about 0.4. And this this kind of gem shows up in a lot of atmospheric fields if you look, look at the low frequency time scale. The next slide, then. Uh, here's an exa uh, another example of the problems we are having with the CSSR. So what's shown is the wind shear in the tropical uh, Atlantic, and there are different various reanalysis compared here. Uh, I'm not going to through, go through the each color, but the very bottom one in the red, which seems like an outlier, is the CFSR. So the wind shear in the tropical Atlantic has been going down since 1980. Has gone down from 1980s to present, and particularly after 95, and it has. Also, I mean, the consequence of this has been increased hurricane activity in the tropical Atlantic. So almost all the reanalysis, except the CFSR, uh, have some similarity, and CFSR in this case seems to be uh, an outlier. So there are issues in the – there's some issues uh, we are trying to resolve and try to fix in the next generation of the NSEP reanalysis that Bob will describe later. Uh, next slide, Dan. Uh, this is basically a summary, so you can read it here. Uh, much more realistic high-frequency features in the CFSR. Um, there are some issues with the low-frequency variability, and I'll hand it over to Bob at this time. And the last uh, last slide has some papers related to CFSR. The paper describing the entire analysis came out in August 2010 issues of the band. And uh, I'm done here, so Bob, you can take over. Okay, yeah, Bob, are you on the phone? I'm here. Okay, great. So I'm going to switch it over, switch control over to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to concentrate on a comparison of uh, CFSR, MERA, and AIR interim looking at the global time series of global precipitation. Hey, and Bob. Uh, yes. So we can actually see your slides. I think you have to go into the uh, event. Oh, I didn't see the thing desktop. yet. Right. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I've That's my experience. I've done that before, and I've done this multiple times. So. Yeah. Oh, there it is. No yep, sorry. No problem. Okay, great. I think it should load in a moment. All right, try it again. Okay. Yep, okay, we can see your slides. All right, here we go. Okay, as I was saying, we're going to be comparing the three reanalyses for a time series of global precipitation, and we'll look at the impact of observing systems, and that will lead into an introduction to, uh, as Arun said, the uh, follow-up system, the CFSR. One of the challenges to interpreting real uh, reanalysis uh, time series is the impact of observing system changes. And in particular, the two I want to focus on today are the introduction of SSMI in 1987 and the M2A, also called ATOBS, uh, beginning in uh, October of 1998. We're going to demonstrate uh, with a comparison of the monthly mean uh, globally average precipitation time series, again, from the CFSR, uh, the year, year interim. We'll also have a plot of uh, year, uh, the, uh, pardon me, Era 40 on there, uh, but again, I'm, I'm not going to discuss much about that. And then MERA, and then an independent estimate from GCPC. Uh, and the caveat here is, again, don't focus on the absolute values, but we're going to focus on the discontinuities in the time series. All right, the first comparison uh, compares ERA interim and CFSRR. Uh, the top graph is from the air interim peer, uh, paper by Dick D. et al. The bottom paper is from Saha. Uh, in, in the air interim uh, diagram, the black is the era 40, and you can see the problems they had there in their trace over the period from 1979 until they ceased in 2003. The blue curve on the top is the GC, uh, GPCP uh, independent estimate, which is fairly flat. And then the era interim, you can see, has made a remarkable progress over era 40 and its consistency and getting, you know, if 
uh, it's removed uh, the large discontinuities that ear 40 had. And you note I have a red line down the middle here. When we look at CFSR and following up to one of the slides uh, Arun showed, you, the CFSR three plots are for ocean and land in black, the ocean in red, and the land in uh, blue. And I highlighted the, dis the introduction of the ATOVs in 98, and you notice the discontinuity that's sharpest in the uh, precipitation over the oceans, uh, which is actually somewhat, it must be stealing moisture from the land because the ocean uh, is larger and the land actually uh, gets larger in the ocean uh, in red and the blue of the land actually is somewhat smaller. So the other thing to note here, as I mentioned, there were uh, two observing systems we wanted to focus on. Note that the CFSR did not assimilate the SSMI data. That becomes relevant when we go to the next slide, when we bring in the MERA diagram. This was taken from figure 18 in uh, Basilevich's uh, Journal of Climate paper in 2011. He actually used the same diagram as uh, was in the D paper, but overlaid the uh, experiment, uh, both MERA and some experimentations they did with MERA on top of it. The green line is the MERA precipitation, and you'll notice the discontinuity again uh, highlighted uh, by the circle on the right at the start of the AMSU period. Also note, on the left, I highlighted the 1987 period, and you see the discontinuity in the MERA precipitation uh, when the SMI, SSMI was started. One of the things Merritt tested, and it's in the uh, light blue, let me see if I can get my uh, arrow pointed out there, it's this trace here. And that was actually a denial test where they removed the, uh, and it says N15, the AMSUA data from NOAA 15. And they ran for several months after when it actually was introduced. And it's, that demonstrated that the MSUA data in NOAA 15 was the actual uh, cause for the change in the precipitation uh, time trace. However, that's not a viable solution because MSUA is was a breakthrough instrument for the, the bulk of the the, the atmosphere <laughs> and the quality of the analysis. So. What Mara did was a consultation with Dick D, and he noted that when Era Interim got to the point where MSUA was introduced, they removed four channels, the so-called window channels, which have a strong, that they observed the same atmospheric phenomena, uh, the, 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 the radiation being measured by those channels is very similar to that being measured by the SSMI. So in, in a crude sense, what you have is sort of a duplication here. Uh, and perhaps, as some of my colleagues have said, maybe an overestimate by the AMSU window channels. So when they did that, and if we go up to this uh, little inset, they seem to have, uh, and the, the test that they did was in the orange here. And you can see it is sort of in between when they included all the window channels and when they pulled out all of the uh, uh, AMSU data completely. So this was a step in the right direction. So if we go to a summary, whoops. All right, I've lost control. I'm not advancing. Uh, Bob, can you, if you just click on the slide that's open, does it, will it move you? Oh, there we go. Yeah, the, the mouse worked, not the keyboard. Yeah. Okay. All right, summarizing the, uh, summarizing the instruments here for these three experiments across the discontinuity. Era A uh, interim was uh, assimilating all the channels of SSMI, but it had dropped the window channels. 
Mara assimilated, again, all seven channels of SSMI and then brought in all the AMPS-UA channels. And then they've tested dropping the window channels. CFSS, CFSR did not assimilate SSMI, so it didn't have the early discontinuity, but, a, but it did bring in all the channels of AMPS-UA. And so, as Arun alluded to, we have a follow-up system to CFSR, a lower resolution system uh, at T126. It has been updated with the 2011 GSI and the CFS V2 prediction model, the seasonal prediction model that is running and making daily seasonal predictions in operations for NCEP. Of many of the questions which we don't have time to discuss that we've learned from CFSR have been addressed in this system. So, uh, for example, the Arun showed that question of the, uh, uh, the wind shear in the Atlantic. That has been addressed, and it had to do with something Gil introduced in his talk, the background errors. Uh, we were using background errors developed in the uh, late 2000s and then applying them in the 1980s and 1990s in the tropics. They were not appropriate, so we've corrected that. The other thing we hope to do, possibly with CFSR, is CFSR Lite is to replace R1. That's the long-standing assimilation from 48 to the 78 in the non-satellite era period, uh, if you ignore VTPR, and then from 79 to the present. And this system has uh, been intensely tested for the last two years. And the current test that we're running as we speak is a test of 1988 uh, 1998 and 1999 with the ERA uh, interim SSMI and AMPS-UA configuration. And we want to see uh, where we stand with the latest model and assimilation, whether we get a similar result to ERA interim. And at that point, I'll bring it to a close. Great, Bob. Thanks so much. And Arun, thank you for this uh, final talk. So it's about 2 o'clock right now, but the speakers have all indicated that they can hang around for a little bit on the phone lines for questions. Um, so if anybody has, if anyone uh, in the room here has a question for uh, any, of the, uh, any of the speakers, um, please feel free to ask or just a general discussion topic, either is appropriate. Does anyone on the phone line have a question? This is Ray Arad at Iowa State. I have a question for Gil. Yes. Yeah. Um, Gil, you used the um, T62 uh, GFS08 experimental version. And um, my understanding of how these things are done is that that is um, a similar model family to what was used for, say, the NCEP NCAR, and so for T62, the NOAA GFS or climate forecast system, whatever. Um, were there any significant differences in the reanalysis model between the 20th century reanalysis and those earlier efforts? Um, yeah, Ray, there, there are um, a whole host of differences. Um, at least in, in my opinion, when you go through the suite of parameterizations that was used in the NCEP NCAR reanalysis model, that's, a, that's like a 1995 vintage model. So NCEP, EMC, and the, some of the other speakers on the phone can probably speak more eruditely about the, the details. Um, but NCEP, EMC had 13 years of model development. And it, about every six months, there's a, there's a new update or so to the model. Um, just a few examples. The clouds are prognostic variables in the GFS 2008. Um, the cloud liquid water. Is, is actually being predicted. The ozone is being predicted. Um, it's, it's the same resolution, and it's a, it's a similar dynamical core, but there are a, a whole suite of, um, of differences that we could go through kind of point by point. It's much, in some respects, it's much closer to the very high resolution model that Arun was discussing, but run at a lower resolution than it is to the, the, the NCEP NCAR-1 model. Okay. Gil, Thank you. Hi, this is Suru from EMC. Yes, Suru. 
One is, uh, I think, the, some of the major differences is that we have the land surface model. Which oh, yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> it was a two-level uh, OSU model was replaced by the NOAA four-level uh, surface uh, land surface model. The radiation, uh, both long wave and short wave, were changed. Um, the uh, uh, parameter, uh, the sea ice model is interactive. So, I mean, it is, you're right, this is much closer to the high resolution CFSR than it is to R1, and it is 13 or 14 years worth of improvements and upgrades that went into the um, model that you ran. Right. Ray, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. I, I've always been curious about the extent to which these reanalyses are, are sensitive to differences in the model that. Uh, that the data goes into, as well as the you know, data itself. Right, and that's a swapping out that model is um, is not a trivial challenge. Yeah, I, I can comment on it as Bob Kistler. Uh, we part of the testing we've done with the CFSR light was a model swap. Um, uh, we found that that's why we went to the CFS V2 model. We found it better for a long term reanalysis than perhaps the latest NCEP NCAR or no the latest NCEP uh, production model. And and here we're caught in this issue of climate versus weather. That short term weather results don't often translate into long term climate uh, continuity. And that's one of the problems we're struggling with uh, is coming up with a suitable model for a reanalysis. Hey, Dan, this is Arun. So, so the reanalysis are very different in terms of the derived quantities. So if you look at the, one of the slides Bob showed, and we look at the rainfall, the MIRA might range the global mean from 2.6 versus CFSR, which goes to 3.3. So if you look at the quantities which are not, not being assimilated, there are a huge amount of differences still in the, in the reanalysis, so rainfall, surface wind stresses, Surface fluxes, etc., or the top of the radiation budget or the surface radiation budget. So those things are very different still. Thanks for the question, Ray. Are there any other questions on the phone line or in the room? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, the next MAP webinar is going to be on March 13th on the topic of climate model development. Sorry. And uh, Ben, can I can I uh, make some comments? Yeah, please. That really sort of connects my presentation with uh, with Gil's presentation. Uh, if possible, can you show my uh, PC for for while? I can actually just pop the slide up uh, quickly if you'd like to tell me. Those are the slides that I actually didn't send to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I made that up this morning. So. Okay. Yeah. Let me switch it over to you. Okay, and then yeah. click share my desktop. Yeah, I know. So, uh, actually, this, these are the few slides that I just made up this morning. I skipped this uh, in the talk because of lack of time. The question I have at the end is that whether we can actually get a more consistent storm track analysis that extends back to before 1950. And so that this actually uh, relates to a question that I want to ask Gil, is what are the, are there any plans to do, uh, what, what are the plans? So let me sort of present this here. I show this figure which shows the ensemble spread average over respective regions. Uh, so you can see that after 1950, it's pretty consistent. Right, right. Uh, but we also see actually in 1880 to 1910, uh, over the Atlantic, at least, it's actually sort of flat at sort of a large value, but actually not at large. Right, right. And the thing is that actually what I calculated was actually a signal-to-noise ratio, which is a analysis variance divided spread variance. So what you see is that over the Pacific, uh, not over the Atlantic and uh, North America and Europe, this signal-to-noise ratio is actually quite large, even for this period. Right. Uh, and obviously, there's uh, very little observation over the Pacific, so it's oh. So perhaps we can sample the observations based on 1880 to 1910 data density for the entire analysis 
period and then get a consistent soundtrack analysis. They may not be very good, but at least they are consistent. Uh, and then we can actually see how robust they are uh, uh, and use multiple reanalysis based on randomly selecting observations at such a density after 1950. Now, for the Pacific, it's not as good. Uh, even if we use the 1920s observation density, the signal-to-noise ratio is still barely free. If we move to the 1930s, then there's some hope. So for the Pacific, perhaps 1930s observation density may provide a somewhat useful storm track analysis. So I think that's sort of uh, a suggestion that, well, because it's actually a lot of uh, efforts in trying to get a climate consistent analysis. It seems that to get sort of second order quantity to be consistent for a longer period of time, we really have to sample the, to thin the data uh, and to, 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 to an earlier epoch. Um, so that's, uh, that's possible and we had actually um, proposed doing some of those things at and, and um, Right now, uh, probably as you're aware, there are um, there are some resource issues, um, but I I do want to suggest um, to take one other tack, um, and we suggested this in the in the Compo et al. paper, and that's to do your computation using every member. Right now, I assume you're using only the ensemble mean, um, 250 hectopascal meridional wind. Yeah, I thought about it. Uh, the the first thing is that the every member is not available. Oh, it is. Uh, yeah, so I I can um, okay I can send you the link to that. Oh, is that uh, the sort of uh, what it really means uh, in an earlier era when there are very few observations? It's sort of like a climate mode driven. So what what we showed was that you never um, you never approach. You, you never reach the limit of having no observations and just having run a climate model um, in the northern hemisphere. Okay. There's always some information. It could still be incorrect, but there's always some information. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge is to try to tease out the consistent information between the epochs. Right. Okay, right. Ed, Edmund and Gil, I think that uh, this may be more of an offline discussion. At sure, that's no problem, I Sam. appreciate the vigor of the discussion. <laughs> it's really excellent. Um, so uh, we're going to call it call it quits at this point. Um, as I was saying, the next webinar is March 13th. It's on the topic of climate model development. Our three speakers are Chris Bretherton, Chris Farrell, and Jarwi uh, Dong. My apologies for saying that. Yep. And thank you to the speakers for hanging on for a few extra minutes and for your excellent presentations. Hey, thanks again, Dan, for inviting us. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah. Ben. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.